we are here for the Facebook uh, developers meetup. We usually have a smaller group and a very uh, uh, noisy inter interactive group. Wow. So I hope we can keep it interactive even with the size that we have today. Um, our MC for the evening is going to be Dave McClure. And uh, before I introduce him, he actually doesn't need an intro in the Facebook world. Before I introduce him, I want to thank Google and Elizabeth Lynn for the awesome hospitality and taking care of all the details, every tiny detail uh, through the day, through the present uh, preparation. <laughs> and uh, you all have seen uh, Lawrence Sinclair. This is Lawrence group, and he's in Vietnam now. So we miss Lawrence, and hopefully we'll be able to send him some video or, or blog this and you know, catch the spirit of the evening. So with that, let me introduce Dave McClure of 500 Hats, and he's here without a single hat today. <laughs> and he's going to be the MC of the evening, and uh, yeah, let's nice. find out about Open Social and what it means for Facebook developers. Thanks. Sure. So uh, I think my official role tonight is just to cut off the speakers when they're going over. That's about it. Uh, hi, I'm Dave. Uh, just want to welcome everybody here. Um, for people who are in the back, actually, there is room in the front if you want to just sit down. Uh, we have some more room there. Uh, come on up and get to know us. All right, so uh, Patrick Shanazan, uh, developer advocate for Open Social, which is a highfalutin uh, name for a developer evangelist, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Patrick's been keeping all this stuff under tight wraps for months upon months, and now he's out in the open and talking about Open Social to Facebook developers. So do you think you can convert some of this crowd tonight, Patrick? Let's see. All right. Let's try. So Patrick Shanazan, let's take it away. OK, th thanks, Dave. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Patrick Chanazon. I'm the developer advocate for Open Social API. And uh, today, I'm going to present briefly what Open Social is, uh, where it's going, and uh, also show you a few examples of uh, Open Social applications. Uh, as you saw, I, I was kind of struggling. Uh, usually, I have all the, uh, all the website or where I, I'm already signed, and I have profiles on all these various containers for open social. I had to just uh, struggle to get them logged in on, on this uh, PC. Yeah, so the, when, when Facebook, uh, and, and actually the, to this crowd, it's no, no big news. Uh, when Facebook released their API uh, last April, uh, everybody realized that there was a craving from users for more social applications. And uh, right now, I think there are something like 5,000 social applications on Facebook. And after they released their API, all the, um, um, all the websites which, which had a social component, including Google, uh, started thinking, OK, how, how are we going to create some APIs uh, to expose the social graph of, of our users? And um, so at Google, instead of... Um, Instead of just reinventing uh, uh, our own API and doing it for ourselves, um, uh, we, uh, th there's a culture at Google uh, to think at scale. Uh, so we are trying to make the web better and think at, at the web scale. And here the goal was to make the web better, making it more social. And the goal was to say, instead of creating an API just for us, let's talk with uh, these other social sites um, who are also thinking about creating some APIs. And maybe we can agree on a common set of APIs, some kind of intersection of what uh, every social application developer would need in terms of functionality. And that's what open social is. It's, um, so you have all these social sites uh, that, um, um, that, that have um, this data about users. And when you're an application developer, uh, what, what you want to do on these sites is to access the friends graph, the profile of the users, and uh, what Facebook calls the news feed, and what we call in open social activity stream. But you have users on all these. And uh, when you're creating an application, you have to, if everybody was using different APIs, you'd have to use all this mishmash of APIs. And, when we looked at that, it really looked like um, uh, accessing sites uh, before HTML and HTTP. You had a bunch of uh, uh, protocols like Gopher or Archie or FTP. And then when, when Tim Berners-Lee created this ver these very simple standards, uh, HTML and HTTP, 
suddenly all these web applications started, uh, uh, th th there was a big ecosystem and uh, uh, lots of applications were created. So the goal of open social is to make the, the same thing, make a simple standard uh, quite easy to implement uh, for social applications. So it's not Google social, it's really open social. Uh, when, we, uh, when we announced uh, the API two weeks ago, uh, so there, there's a video on codegoogle.com slash open social uh, of the launch announcement, and you'll see demos by, by all these container partners who implemented the API. Uh, so there, there's 15 containers who signed up to implement uh, the open social API. It's not really only a Google thing. So the idea here is to have a common layer and then you're coding to that common layer and then your application can just live in any of these uh, containers. So I, I just cut through the marketing thing uh, quite quickly to go to the code section because this audience seems to be uh, more developer oriented. Actually, before I continue, who here uh, is a developer, uh, is coding every day? Okay, yeah, so we, we'll, we'll just skip the marketing stuff and, and go quickly to the code. Uh, so, yeah, so for developers, it's distribution. You have a bunch of containers in there. You can look at the press release. There's tons of stuff in there. The idea is that there's 200 million users gathered in all these containers. So when you're creating your application, it's a very large distribution. It's standard-based. Uh, that's an important aspect. Uh, open social applications are just HTML and JavaScript. And this, is, this was really one of uh, an important uh, design requirement for us to create this API. It's not a proprietary markup. Um, so for websites, uh, external developers are going to, uh, to do the, these, all these features for, for you. Uh, one of the different aspects of open social compared uh, Compared to all the hype that there has been about uh, social networks in the past uh, uh, year, uh, we heard a lot about consumer social networks. But there are tons of um, uh, professional social, social networks like LinkedIn, Viadeo, or in France, or Xing in Germany, uh, and um, uh, who also could benefit from uh, having an API and having applications built for them. And they did some really great demo. I'm going. Uh, no, actually, I'm not going to demo them because uh, it's a little bit too long. And Salesforce and Oracle in the CRM world also demoed uh, some application that could be, could be made when making Salesforce being an open social container. And I'm going to, uh, uh, to show that. So how does it work? Uh, the API itself is pretty simple. Um, it's... Um, you're creating, it's an extension of the Google Gadget model. Uh, a Google Gadget is a very simple XML file with a bunch of um, uh, metadata, like you have a title of the gadget, a require section to specify which API you want to use in your gadget. And then you have a content section, which is just pure HTML and JavaScript. So the open social API is implemented by the container and made available to your social application as a JavaScript API. So you're just making JavaScript calls to get the list of friends, uh, to touch the persistence layer. So there's a, a persistence is, a, is kind of a hash map uh, where you can store key value pairs for the user. Uh, and uh, the activity stream, same thing, you can post to the activity stream. All these APIs are also exposed as a REST API for social application developer who want to create their application on the server side. So there, instead of making the calls on the client side in JavaScript, they can make the calls on the server side. They do REST calls. And uh, the REST API is exposed, on the, uh, is exposed as, as a Atom uh, syntax uh, feeds an Atom publishing protocol for, uh, for uh, putting, posting, and deleting entries. Uh, plus some uh, namespaced extensions that are specific to open social. But the goal here is that uh, every open social site would expose the same API and eventually have some extended characteristics where containers can differentiate themselves. And I, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the core services, so you have uh, people. This is uh, your friend's graph. Uh, and then um, uh, friends, who do I know? 
activities, what I'm doing, so that's uh, posting and getting some um, uh, activities. For example, Patrick just posted a, a picture or rated a movie in Flexer. And, and there's this persistence API that, that's really not to be uh, mixed up with a full-blown database. Uh, persistence is really for uh, developers of social applications who don't want to maintain their own server. They don't want to maintain their own database. Their application will just be uh, an XML file with some JavaScript calls and HTML, eventually a few CSS and JavaScript files. And therefore, the persistence, they have access to a hash map for the current user where they can store key value pairs. And the hash map is shared with their friends, which is the application can access their friend's data in there. So it makes it very possible for uh, hobbyist developers to create compelling applications without ever having their own server. So let's take a look at the code here. Um, so. Um, the API itself is uh, um, uh, for everybody who has done a little bit of JavaScript is very traditional JavaScript where you have um, you're, you're making all the call asynchronously and then you're before making the call when you're making the call itself you pass a callback function that will be called back with the results uh, so here what you see there uh, so here I'm creating a, a new data request and there are a bunch of request types. So fetch, fetch person request is to get the profile data on someone. Fetch people request with the constant viewer friends is to get the friends of the current user. Uh, fetch activities request is to get the activity stream of the viewer. And person app data request is this persistence API where I want to look up a key in, um, in the hash map uh, of the persistence API for that user. So because it's asynchronous, you want, to, um, uh, you want to pile all these requests together and make only one, uh, one call to the server. So that's why we're building all these. We're adding them to the request object. And then we are sending the request, passing it a callback. The callback is a function that will be called with the result. The, the keys that you're seeing here, the V, VF, AV, and VD, are just keys into the result set for my callback function. When it will be called back, it will get a, a big result object where it can get uh, the first result under the V key and the second under the VF and all that. So that's, that's quite simple JavaScript. And then when you're, uh, when you're using it, when you're using this data, uh, it's very simple. You just get the data out of the response object, and then you say get viewer, get display name. So you get some JavaScript objects where uh, you get all the data about the user and their friends. Uh, and then you just use plain JavaScript and HTML uh, to display that. So I'm going to show, um, actually, I'm going to show you a, a few real, real examples. If you go to uh, uh, foopy.com slash gadgets, and uh, you're, you're going to forget that, so I'm, I'm going to give you my, uh, uh, my delicious link. I have, um, I have a delicious feed. Uh, yeah. I have a delicious feed uh, at uh, delicious slash my name, so slash Shanazon, and open social. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. People are laughing because I'm using delicious and not the Google. I don't know. I've, I've been using that for years, and it's really a very, very convenient product. So um, under delicious channels on open social, I, I tag all the cool links and demos and documentation uh, that I find uh, about this topic, and actually about all other Google APIs as well. Uh, and this foopy.com. Uh, uh, examples that have been made by uh, uh, Graham Spencer from our engineering team are, are really a good resource. So this is what a gadget look. Ah, yeah, I, I need Notepad here. So I, I <laughs> so that's why I wanted to show that into my uh, uh, into my on my Mac because uh, this stuff doesn't look very good, and there's no wget on. Uh, Oh, view source is a good one. You're right. 
Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's that's better. And then I can do okay. So that that looks better. So that that's kind of what uh, an open social application look like. You have a module and then a title in there with the height. Uh, the require here, you're saying that you want to use the open social 0.5 version. That's the current version of the spec. Um, and then you have the content, which is pure HTML and JavaScript, nicely wrapped into a C data here. And uh, uh, Graham is a very um, software engineer -y software engineer. So his stuff is completely modular. There's really nothing in the view here except uh, he specifies a variable called gadget to load here, which specifies what you're going to see in this uh, XML file. Uh, and everything happens in the uh, command.js uh, command here. So command.js is where, and we're going to take a look at that, is where all the, all the calls happen. So command.js is where all the, um, um, in a model view controller, this would be the view part of things. So here he has this gadget hello, uh, which, um, uh, which defines a function where he gets uh, an ID called, uh, he gets a div called main, and he writes some HTML in there, and he passes data into it. Uh, and all the other, um, all the other um, uh, functions are pretty much the same. They use the data that come from open social calls, and then they display them um, in HTML. So now I'm going to, to show you what the gadgets look like. So the first one is a very simple gadget. This is on the awkward sandbox. Uh, and actually, I, I, I need to say that today, open social the, the release that happened two weeks ago is a, a release for developers. Uh, the open social specification itself is not finished. Uh, there are still very important issues like security that haven't been defined, and we are working to define them. Uh, as we speak, we had a meeting about that with uh, other partners uh, last week. So, um, so security is not defined. That's why it's running in Sandbox uh, on Orkut, on Plaxo, uh, on Ning as well, and High Five. Um, and, and so for developers, they can sign up for this sandbox uh, and test the gadget. So this is the, the Hello World gadget, which is pretty simple. Now let's go to a, a more interesting gadget, which is a, a list of my friends. Uh, and we're going to take, so it lists just the pictures, the name, and a string there. And we're going to take a look at what these calls are. So the calls for um, the, okay, so let's open command.js. All the calls, which is the model part of the application, are made here in social norms.js. So this is the interesting part that you, the interesting file that you want to take a look at uh, um, for for where the calls, uh, how to make the calls uh, to open social. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff here, send in initial request. And actually, uh, this is the code that I showed you before. Here, the request add. So initially, when the gadget loads, he's preloading all the data that he'll be interested in uh, for, for the future. <laughs> Uh, uh, in the app, like a uh, person request, all the person's friend, all the all the keys, uh, uh, all, all the data in the persistence API, uh, plus the activity stream. Um, so here, uh, and then he has some helper uh, helper functions uh, that retrieve um, that retrieve the data. For example, get owner. We just get uh, the data that's in the uh, in the O key uh, inside of this uh, uh, of the map of results. So this this request uh, new fetch person request in the O key it's the owner. So so then I have an object that's the owner and I can call uh, um, just I, I can get data out of it. Um, so if you look at uh, this command.js uh, this uh, the my friend app. The friends app here is very simple. I just uh, get the list of friends, I iterate through them, and I put them in a, in a table, 
uh, and I, uh, this uh, add person row method is a method that just creates a nice row, takes the picture, uh, and draws it uh, nicely. Um, so that shows, so the first one was showing the getting a profile data. This one shows how to get the list of my friends and their profile data. The third one actually shows um, uh, the um, persistence API. So here I'm going to give some nuts to my various friends. And uh, next time I click on it, uh, what I, oh, actually, does it work? A cashew nut? Is it what I selected? A red pistachio nut? Yeah, actually, it doesn't work. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> So I, I, I need to, to ask Graham to fix that or, or to look at his app. Because, uh, yeah, the idea is that when you're clicking on that, again, he should be getting into, uh, so getting into the app data, uh, uh, so into this hash map on the key. The key just lists a JSON representation of all the things that I've given to my friends and then pass that and put the right state in there. So here it's not working. So let it not be said that Google is not transparent. <laughs> hey, we are. <laughs> it's um, it's a very much a work in progress, especially on the example side. Uh, this one is, um, so this one I need a friend to do the demo to you. Uh, it's the activity stream. It's the same thing as the previous one, except that every time I give someone something, uh, it's going to post, um, to make a post in their activity stream to say, oh, Patrick has given Dennis uh, a nut. Actually, Dennis, you're here. Maybe you can check your activity stream. Don't tell me it doesn't work either. <laughs> uh, so that, that's kind of, uh, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but that, that, that's kind of the basic example. This foopy.com just gives you a little bit of an example of how to use all the API calls. Uh, after that, I'm just going to do some uh, quick examples of uh, how it will look like in an enterprise context. And, and this is a, a, a social application built by Thikos, um, a company that works with uh, Salesforce.com. So in the Salesforce.com context, I'm going to, um, to call the, the contacts. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, to call someone from this company called Pyramid Constructions. And I mean, the regular. this is the regular Salesforce UI. And what they did is that they added this button called Make Friends that allows me in my thousands of contacts that I have in there to mark those that are my friends. And then when I'm looking at someone that, um, that I want to call, I'm a sales guy, I want to call this guy to sell him something. Here, what they list is the list of people in my company that have contacted this person at this company uh, that I may call before to get an idea about what, uh, uh, what I should tell this person. And uh, if I hover over, over this, I just can see exactly in which context they have been called. Uh, the size is proportional to the number of interaction. And, uh, but this can get and widely. There are tons of people in there. I don't know which one to contact. So the idea here is that I can restrict it to only my friends. Uh, and, and this makes use of the open social, uh, get the list of my friends people. What's really interesting in this example, and uh, Oracle will probably do the same thing for their CRM application, is that here the semantics of get friends get changed uh, by the configuration of the container. So the administrator who adds open social support into, um, uh, into Salesforce can say, when you're looking at a contact, the semantics of get friends means the list of people who have called that person. And then this translates into an Apex request uh, on the backend in Salesforce. But maybe in some other parts of the application, it can mean something completely different. And maybe they can use the same Thikos uh, social application in a different context with a different semantics for get friends. And, and that's a very powerful angle uh, about open social in the context of uh, enterprise software that, that I think we'll see uh, uh, a lot. Uh, I'm going to turn over to, uh, to Kevin, who maybe, do you want to do the, the, the demos for the other containers? Yeah, you, 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 
you know better than me. Oh, okay. So uh, there, there are also other containers who have implemented that, like Ning, which is a network of networks. They are, you can create a network for 10 people on Ning, and they have 100,000 networks. So this is a network for uh, people affected with diabetes, and they are talking about many things, and for example, movies. And here you see the Flickster application, where I can see my favorite movies, uh, the movies I want to see and all that. And when I click on uh, one of them, uh, I'm just going to the, so what we, what we saw before was what we call the profile view, and this is the canvas view on the Flickster application. And here he's retrieving all my data, and uh, my friend Saran, who's from Flickster actually, uh, has a, a bunch of uh, things that he said, and I can look at my friend's movie on that network. So that's using the get friends uh, open social call. And then in the Flickster database, they just use the ID that come back from get friends uh, as a key uh, in their database. So that's how they can retrieve uh, my movies and my friend's movies. And uh, as you can see, I don't have the same taste as uh, Saran in terms of uh, movies. Uh, High Five uh, also implemented open social. Uh, and uh, uh, that's their old, old sandbox. I, I don't know if it's still, uh, let me see. I don't know if it's still active. So they, they, they opened a new sandbox. I, I'm still using their old, their old one. So you, you need to get there. They, they did an announcement. Uh, Plaxo also, but I, I don't remember my user ID on Plaxo. I, I was logged in on my other computer. Uh, but that's kind of... Uh, that's kind of all the examples I wanted to show. Oh, yeah, and uh, another example we showed, and you'll see in the video, is uh, uh, MySpace uh, announced that they are going to implement open social, and they did a very nice demo of uh, one aspect of open social that's important, which is open social is extensible, and you can extend it in two ways. One of the ways is what I call deep extensibility, where you extend the JavaScript object that come back, like the profile, for example, and that's what MySpace ha has done in their demo. So in a MySpace page, you have um, uh, a list of movies that are your favorite movies, so they know that about their users. But the list of movies is not part of the open social uh, uh, profile. So what they did is that they added this list of movies as part of the open social profile, and then Flickster we, we had an all-night hackathon with MySpace and Flickster, and Flickster took advantage of this new uh, feature that's available only on MySpace to say, in addition to showing me my favorite movies and all that, they showed me when I, lo when I add the application for the first time, my favorite movies in MySpace. So they can, they can leverage some container-specific uh, uh, data that is in there. So that's one way of extending it. Another way of extending the API is to add some vertical APIs. And when, when, we showed the, when I showed the, the Salesforce application, uh, there's a lot of CRM-specific uh, methods that could be added by both Salesforce and Oracle for uh, social application designers who design their applications specifically for CRM. So I can, I, I can see um, these deep extensibility plus uh, wide extensibility uh, being some area where there will be a lot of action in the next, um, in the next year. Um, yeah, another advantage of uh, using standard technology is that uh, all the nice example you saw from, um, from Graham, that, that doesn't look very good. If you give it to a CSS designer, uh, you end up with something much nicer. Uh, because it's just uh, you use the, the same kind of um, uh, process that you use for the rest. Um, so the, the, um, the focus right now on open social, it's a 0 0.5 version only for developers. The focus is on finishing up the API, uh, working with the, the partners um, who were there at launch, uh, plus all the all the new partners who, uh, or all the new containers who said they wanted to, they are interested in implementing open social to finish up the spec. Uh, we're still working out what the governance model for the spec will be. Uh, but we had our first meeting last week uh, to start defining a security model for it, uh, an authentication model, and uh, an extensibility model. Uh, so in the next few months, there should be uh, a few uh, containers uh, coming live uh, with that. 
Uh, so yeah, you can find more information at uh, Google, codegoogle.com slash API slash uh, open social. So you claim um, there's 200 million members in the network, and that's impressive. Um, is Forget Friends, is it always sandboxed within the network, or is there any way to branch out of that for viral reasons? <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, maybe you want to answer this one? So um, at the moment, yes, you're, um, within any, any given container, you'll be getting the friends from that container, because that's the model that people are used to, and that's what they've given permission to do. Um, we, can't bridge the, we can't bridge between containers without them giving permission, but it's something we're looking into and something we'd like to do in future is to enable that. The other way of looking at this is classically, if you want to build a new social network site, you have to gather the friends yourself and, and start from scratch. Um, with this, it means you can take the application to where the users are and bring it to all these different networks to do that. So that, that's, if you look at it that way around, it actually saves you the problem of bridging them because you're carrying your app to them. This one? Yeah. Okay. Oh, very good. All right. So it seems like uh, open social is an enhanced embed. So when you look at your total distribution, you're basically taking all the HTML embeds and trying to add a little context around it. So you sniff for JavaScript to see if the open social variable is there, and if it is, you can do something. But that something seems to be different with every single network that you have inside of your coalition of the willing, um, because um, it, it, when, when, when I talk when I talk to one particular app, the friend list that I get back is everyone that has that app installed, for example. And another app, the friends list that I get back, is all, the, all of Niall's friends. So how exactly is this um, going to make life easier when open social will probably be one of two APIs supported by the parent platform? And I'm going to have to code for each of the platforms because they're going to have different interpretations of your standard. Well, part of the point is that... Um, we abstract out the friends model such that it can be interpreted um, differently by the different ones. So the, the goal is to provide something that, that spans the different notions of friend and relationship between them. So we have the notion of viewer and viewer friends and owner and owner friends. Um, the viewer is you going to the, the site and looking at pages. The owner is whoever that page belongs to that has the, the application embedded within it. Um, different sites will have different interpretations of that based on their privacy models. So the, the, the API is general for that. And you saw that, um, for example, within an enterprise context, the viewer is, is you with your, with your colleagues, but um, the owner is potentially somebody from another company, and, and their, their friends are the people who've contacted them. So there's an abstraction there of there's me and the people I'm carrying with me, and there's the person I'm viewing and the people that they have attached to them. And that abstraction is deliberately designed to be sort of loose and minimal such that you can move, say, a how am I connected to this person application from something like Orkut to something like um, Oracle and, and have that, that still work. So it's, um, it's basically designed to be you know, a, as light a um, friends API as we could do, but, but it can bridge those concepts. And having mapped that through a bunch of different containers, we think that does hold. But if there are holes in that, you know, we'd like to hear about them. Um, but yeah, you may find that some containers only allow um, you to look at the page where the viewer is the owner. Um, you can imagine that in a, in a sort of um, an email-like application where you're only looking at your own stuff. Um, also, other containers like Orkut will let you look at anyone's profile. Other containers will only let you look at profiles of people you've been introduced to. So there, there are some constraints there. But for the application, you, you should, in many cases, be able to abstract that out and say, I just want to see the viewer's friends and the owner's friends and see what that makes sense to me as an application without having to understand the science policies. You should still be able to build an app that works against that. And am I not coding for every platform? I would. The same way? Because I'd still have to make sure that it binds correctly? Um, the API should be the same across platforms. That's the point. So, I mean. Yeah, you, you, you've got to interpret what it means. But the, the abstraction should be you've got a, you know, a set of people attached to the person who's viewing and see. A peop, uh, set of people attached to the, to the page that belongs to the person. Uh, that, that said, what, one thing I wanted to add in this area is uh, there may be some differences in the policies between containers, and, and the specification doesn't mandate policy on containers. So what, one aspect that we're discussing right now uh, with all the container partners uh, for extending the API is having a container object that you could introspect that would specify what these policies are in order to make it easier 
for developers to take advantage of the, the various containers' capabilities and policy limitations. Like a global options thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, kind of. Or, or saying you know, whether um, viewers can be anonymous or not. Because that's you know, there's obviously a bunch of privacy implications here. You don't necessarily want to give out the viewer's information to any app that you, that you happen to visit. Um, and different platforms will have different models for how to enforce that. Now, you don't have any opinion about that uh, description neutral coalition of the willing, do you? <laughs> it's hard to form a coalition with unwilling people. Hi. I actually have a, a two part business question. Uh, the first question was this that, like you explained, that uh, you're basically looking at different people's uh, profiles and their interests and, and uh, whatever's on their page, on their, on their profile page, whether it's Orchid or High Five. My question is this. I, if I build a social network for my business and I use uh, the API, am I, in essence, importing that information and sort of Xeroxing it? Or, uh, uh, or is, it that, is it basically uh, sort of bridging the gap instead of importing your uh, MySpace friends onto your uh, Facebook? Is it just sort of letting them stay there, yet having them on your, uh, on your interface nonetheless? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I'll, I'll try and explain that again. <laughs> no. okay, Let me sorry. paraphrase it back yeah. and see if I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so you're saying... Are, are, is this a way for I importing and exporting friend um, information from one site to another? So without, uh, without effectively making them sign up is my point. Um, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, the, the way of looking at it is you're writing an application that has access to friend data, um, and you take that application to where the friend data is. So you take the application um, to MySpace, and it gets the MySpace friend data. You take it to LinkedIn, it gets the LinkedIn friend data. To actually bridge between them, you have to have shared identities that are matched and that are agreed to by the user. So you can't just arbitrarily connect them because they won't make sense in each other's namespace. Now, there are, um, insofar as the profiles are public, you may be able to con connect those together. Um, David Recorden sitting in the front row has got a bunch of ideas about how to do that well, and you can ask him about those. Um, and there are, you know, there are people inside Google looking at that as well um, to connect the public profile data. But clearly, the private profile data we can't connect without the user's permission. So we'd have to work out a way to bridge that. And that's something we're looking at for this, but that's a sort of a, a later stage model of, of how to bridge stuff between. Um, the, the way of thinking about it is, instead of building your own social network for your business, you can take your application to the existing social networks that already exist. But if you think about it that way, it means that instead of having to get everyone to register and sign up for you, you can take the apps to, to where they, they happen to be and, and connect to those. So stay there, but they're still working with you? Uh, yes. So yeah. if, if I have like 10 people from MySpace, they don't have to sign up for me. They stay at MySpace. Yes. Well, they may have to, depending on what you're doing, they may have to install your application right. to say, OK, yes, I agree this application can see my friend data. And that will depend on the site. Okay. No, I mean, you can imagine in a corporate environment, you could whitelist a bunch of applications and let them have access to the whole place. The other thing is that depend, also this may depend on how you want to implement your application. If you're just using the um, container application data store, um, then you're not necessarily sending data back out to your own site. Um, so that can operate almost entirely in isolation. Um, whereas if you want to send that data to your own site, you'll have to do some more work to, to map their IDs into your database and so on. Uh, you mentioned the movies uh, extension for MySpace. Is your expectation that you're going to define some optional standards for things like that, or is it going to be anybody can define their own at will? A uh, bit of both. We're going to try and converge as much as we can. Um, we started out deliberately with the simplest thing that could possibly work, the, the most limited person profile that we could come up with. We want to try and extend that a bit more to add more information to that. There are some aspects of that that are tricky. Um, one of them is if we start putting contact information in, there's a permissioning problem of giving email addresses out to applications without um, other people's email addresses, not just your own. There's that issue. Um, there's also an issue of, is there a common representation for favorite movies that we can share? Favorite movies, there probably is. Some of the other fields that these social networks sites have are, are more um, site-specific, and they, therefore, they would, they'll be able to add them in. But the, um, both the models both the JavaScript model and the XML model are, ex are naturally extensible in, in slightly different ways. And we're, we're working to make that converge as much as we can um, for, for, the, for that, the, that information records and then leave space for extensibility. So why don't we take one more question and then go back to some more demos. 
Okay, another um, question around extension. At the very beginning of the presentation, we were talking about uh, Tim Berners-Lee and HTML. Now I remember the good old days of, uh, you know, uh, Mozilla, uh, Netscape 1.0, the Mosaic browser before that, and of course the first version of Internet Explorer. Now, the reason for saying all of that is I remember HTML worked well when it wasn't being arbitrarily extended, as with all of the lovely scrolling things that you used to get in Internet Explorer. How are you going to try and prevent uh, the open social API from suffering the same problems? Um, well, partly because we've been Kevin's through that. really smart. <laughs> partly because we've been through that experience and you know, know know what it was like, um, and that's why we're trying to pull together a, a, a group of containers developers to to agree on common standards, and then um, we're still trying to work out the details of how we get that to explicitly converge. We've got some ideas, and um, we've got um, also we. As Patrick says, we've got a bunch of um, open mailing lists up at, the, at that site where you can c contribute and join in on that. But, but there's not going to be any Google policing of the API necessarily to say you must adhere to only these. No, I mean it's 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 JavaScript, it's XML, it's HTML. It's got it's got a bunch of really well defined standards about how those behave and how they are naturally extensible. You know, HTML has the must has the you know must ignore um, and the JSON. Structures naturally let you add records to them, and XML has a bunch of namespace extensions. There's, there's a bunch of well-known ways to extend these things. Um, what we're going to try and do is define a core that can interoperate, but leave the space open to extend and, and possibly roll back, you know, shared extensions in if we can. Um, you know, the the goal is not to say right, this is it, the, the be all and end all, and everything we we've frozen for all time. It's to build something that that you know actually works like the web. Um, and you know, if you look at if you look at HTML and, and JavaScript, there's a whole bunch of work to extend those standards going on at the moment as well, and which, which we're participating and other people are participating. But if, um, the thing that's changed since the browser wars is that the abstractions have come back. We don't have, um, we have a, um, an HTML structure abstraction and we have a CSS visualization abstraction now. We have a JavaScript scripting abstraction. Um, rather than everything's in HTML and if you want to make something scroll, you have to add an element to the, to the HTML markup. So the, 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 there's a sort of tripartite split there, a model view controller split, if you like, already in effect um, in, in how we're building these web applications. And you know, anyone who's building web stuff these days doesn't use Marquee. If they want something to scroll, they'll write some JavaScript to do it. OK, so um, thanks to both Patrick and Kevin for giving us the presentation. We're going to move on to a few other demos. Uh, first up is Bruno Rovagnati from Globant. And he's going to give us an open social demo. Uh, so quick round of applause, though, for Patrick and Kevin. <laughs> How many people are in the are in the room tonight who are in our Stanford class on building Facebook apps? Could you raise your hands real quick? All right. So uh, I just wanted to congratulate the Kiss Me uh, application developers crossed a million users about uh, half an hour ago, an hour ago. So uh, congrats to those guys. Awesome. Cool. And I believe the uh, Send Hotness app is fast on their trail and looks likely to break a million users within a couple of days. So uh, we'll watch that closely. Well, All right, Bruno, take it away. Hello. Well, my name is Bruno Rovagnati. I'm from Argentina. Well, in fact, I work for Globan, but this is a personal project. I started with one friend from Argentina like uh, well, to see what, what was about this new social effect. We started working with Facebook, and well, the idea, since my background is I'm working with Google Checkout integration for the last year, I'm the responsible for integrating Google Checkout with o o OS Commerce and SendCard. The same for the PHP sample code. Perhaps if somebody uses it, well, that's my code. And well, my background is e-commerce. So I worked with Patrick for the last year, and he said, why not just start working on something with social and e-commerce. So we start developing this BuyFast API, sorry, BuyFast uh, program. The idea is to use the social stuff to sell and buy items. So the idea is basic. You publish products, you add any product that you like with, with some basic, basic things. We use tags to search. And the idea is that you invite friends and you see your friends what, what they are selling. So here you have my friends and see what they are selling and move around the, the graph and the social stuff. <laughs> no. 
So here you have uh, some some stuff that you can review, you can add tags, you can rate, and you can also share share the product so you can publish it in your profile. So let me. You misspelled T-shirt. It's really wrong. I'm sorry. I'm a Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> well, you make me blur. <laughs> it's great marketing. It's great marketing. Don't worry about it. Trust me, it was not intentionally. <laughs> what can I say? Well, the idea, well, as you see, you can publish the product here in your profile, and you can also invite friends to say, well, I recommend you this product, and this way, move and sell. You always have a, a, another similar products, persons that, or products that, that match the tax you put, and also other persons that can review your product and add more tax, so you can also make a kind of network of tax, so you can move in the tax. Well, what, this was the beginning, the first idea, and well, I think it was a month or two months ago, Patrick uh, invited me, and I have to thank that, to be a beta tester for Open Social. So I have the privilege to, to be one of the, the first developers to, to test the, the first versions of the API. So we start developing this for Open Social. So mainly the concept is, is similar. We have a very similar UI. The idea is to have all the same functionalities, but with one, one, one extra thing. My idea was to put this by fast network over the networks, so we can join both social graphs. Right now, as you can see, I have two users. One user for open social, and one, well, in this particular Orkut, and one user for Facebook. As he said, there's a way you match these graphs. I could map my user with the other user so I can jump over the networks and interact in both networks so I can see friends that, well, as you can see, you don't see the photo because that photograph belongs to a Facebook user. We are, well, trying to find out some ways to don't break policies and have access to Facebook information while we are on the other containers. So right now I can see Ignacio Blanco, who is a friend that belongs to both networks. This one that in fact is my girlfriend that has only a Facebook, a Facebook profile, but she's my friend, not in Orkut, but in Facebook. And I still can see her products. They're still missing some information since, well, this kind of thing we, we are talking about, uh, how, how to join information through networks. So we still we have the same information in both networks. And anything that I change in the social API is Orkut or Facebook, it will be reflected in both, in both systems. This way, we, we could build a supra network, if I can say it that way. So we can join both social graphs. Oh, well, this is working. You can buy. You can actually buy with with Google Checkout, and you have full full access to the stuff. I don't. Know. That's functionality more like uh, regarding the 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 commerce stuff. You have your products, your your sales. You can see what you sell, you can charge, you can move, you can ship, and you can follow the, all the, the parts of the e-commerce. And you also can, in all those products, also continue re reviewing the product. Uh, you can rate the, the merchants, so you can search top, top sellers, top buyers, who, who are the best merchants. The idea is to globalize all the information so you can have access to many friends, many products, by moving inside of network sellers, of network, uh, social networks, and you don't have a container, it's a super container. That's the idea that I have. That's more or less what I, what I want to talk and show you.
Thanks. Just want to take a couple of quick questions. Yes. I'm just looking for a little bit more clarity on how you did the friends mapping as far as having, like, for example, a Facebook user in Orchid as far as saying that this is the same person. Yeah, th that was a little headache. Uh, well, <laughs> Facebook doesn't give you an email, but Orchid does. So when mapping uh, from Facebook to, to open social is easy. Since I asked for an email, I validate that the user belongs to the system. I email him a unique URL with a secret phrase and when he clicks and uh, puts that secret phrase it's in the demo this is a stable version i don't want to put that in the demo and when he clicks there he adds that phrase and i join automatically both networks one issue that i didn't mention is when obviously when you go to f to facebook you have uh, the the orkut friends list is cached on our server and vice versa there's a policy in Facebook that you, you, you can cache only for 24 hours. So that information, if that user don't enter Facebook in, in one day, that information will be lost. So that network won't be joined until the user enters again Facebook or our application in Facebook. And vice versa, the other way around, for uh, Orkut to Facebook, I instead of asking an email, I ask, his user ID, his user user ID, and when he enters his page, like a pop up, it shows. Well, you want to confirm, like if he was entering his email, and that way like, he confirms that he, that Facebook account belongs to him, and I can map it. Uh, any other questions? Okay, back there. Uh, Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> I just used <laughs> or abuse, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh Dan, do you want to go ahead and maybe start getting ready also for your demo? Uh, I, I can maybe answer that one. Um open social just defines the programming model, not the policy that the various containers will have. Uh for Kut I, I don't know, and for the other social networks I, I don't know either. <laughs> So is Facebook going to join Open Social Alliance? Uh, I don't know if there's any Facebook uh, representatives in the room, but I think they'd be qualified to answer that. Probably not. Uh, unless, Patrick, have you heard lately? We certainly do hope so. Just provide an implementation of the Open Social API. Sorry, the question was, how do you get listed on the partner page for s Open Social? It's nice in the open link, yeah. yeah. There are a handful of spammers listed. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Okay. Uh, Grab I don't Patrick know. after this session and sit on him until he gets you listed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, next up, thanks uh, again, Bruno, for a great demo. Uh, next up yeah, is Dan yeah. Lester, who's also going to show us an example of Facebook open social integration. Okay, hello. I'm here to talk about OpenSocket, and that's a open social container that we've written inside Facebook. Okay, so the background to this is uh, sort of lies in the supposed rivalry between Google and, and Facebook that the, the press have invented or exaggerated maybe even uh, reported accurately. And the, the, the sort of fantasy is that I've just turned up and knocked their heads together and, and said, well, maybe it's not even up to you anyway. You know, the, the technology will do whatever the technology can do. And you know, don't go artificially restricting technology without my permission, please. And, well, of course, in reality, they, they don't really care, I'm sure. But uh, that was a dream. So who am I, who am I that uh, I'm motivated... Uh, to produce this, some people have asked, uh, you know, do I work for Microsoft undercover, possibly, or the CIA? Um, I, I'm really just here on vacation and, and thought this would be an interesting project. Um, okay, so when I, wanted to, when I uh, came up with this idea, I, I sent a message out on the 
develop a mailing list asking if anyone wanted to get involved. And Ignacio Blanco from Argentina, obviously, shared my sense of humour and uh, I wanted to join in. So any container challenges that we, uh, we came across in building a container, okay, because this is a, you know, an early example of, of a container that's been built without, without the uh, coercion of, of Google. And uh, so you know, what, what uh, problems did we have starting from scratch? I want to talk about the differences in the platforms that this highlights. You know, I'm, I'm trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole here. So what shape did it come out? And uh, finally, I want to talk passionately about the, uh, the open source projects that really are needed to move open social forward. OK, so if I just demonstrate the gadget in or cut. Okay, so we have here profile collage, which allows the user to view a grid of uh, their friend's pictures and click through to their profiles. So well, I'd describe it like it's actually useful, but of course I just wanted to come up with something that uh, uses the friends functionality. So we see the same thing in Facebook. Okay, so this is the OpenSocket application, and we just enter the the same gadget URL here, or I have a shortcut. Okay, so the same thing there. You can see it with my millions of Facebook friends. Okay, so I just want to talk briefly about how we do that. Okay, so an open social gadget, as, as Patrick has said, is, is a Google gadget that has this require feature equals open social 0.5 at the top and presumably makes use of the, the Friends API and whatever else a bit further down. Uh, so first of all, I'll just talk about how we, we'd host a normal Google gadget. Um, and so Google gadgets that don't have open social 0.5, of course, we know as anti-social gadgets. <laughs> okay, so What, uh, what uh, happens from Facebook, just as any other Facebook application, it makes a, a call to our server, uh, and it passes along here the, the URL of the gadget. Okay, so I go and fetch the, the gadget XML uh, and, and start drawing that on my canvas page. So that's enough information to draw the, the blue outline. Okay. Um, what I then do is, okay, I, I've got the, the code for the gadget, so the HTML and the JavaScript, and I, I could just put it inside um, the blue frame that I've drawn, but uh, the only problem is on the Canvas page, uh, Facebook uh, will, will impose their, their JavaScript on that, okay, so FBJS. Okay, so I mean, if anyone you know, doesn't know what that is, um, I mean, it's quite, it's quite brilliant, really, that what, what, uh, what Facebook did was they wanted to get JavaScript into, uh, into their applications, but thought it was a bit dangerous because different apps could uh, interfere with each other. So they thought, well, let's, let's release our own version of JavaScript that's a bit cut down and restricted. And, of course, they write that in JavaScript, uh, which is, well, it's insane, really, but uh, it, it works. Okay, so what I do is just to set up an iframe, and uh, the source to the iframe is a gadget wrapper script that we've written. Okay, so inside that, well, it goes to get the, the gadget XML again. Uh, it should cache that, of course. And we stick that into the, the iframe. Okay, so enough of being antisocial. How does an open social uh, gadget work here? So if we come across the, the requires tag, what we do is we, uh, before we, we dump this code into the iframe, we just put a script reference at the top of the code to our own implementation of, of the open social object there. Okay, and another thing we do is we, we just write a, an array. So just in JavaScript, we, we write an array of what I've called here FB params. And I mean, they're just the, the sort of Facebook session data. Okay, so the, it has the user ID and also allows us to authenticate the user and then talk to the Facebook servers. Okay, so just have a quick look how that might work. Okay, so we have the, the friend dump example as well. That's uh, a fairly standard gadget going around. Okay, so what happens when this gadget wants to go and get that list of friends that it's displayed there? So we saw some code like this a little bit earlier. 
we want to get the, the viewer friends. Uh, and it's invoking that call there on our version of the open social object, OK? So the, the third party gadget doesn't really know where it's running, of course. Uh, it could be in Ning or, or anywhere else. So that code there uh, calls on our open socket JavaScript, OK? And what we then do is, is say, well, how do we get that list of friends? What I've chosen to do, and th this is all sort of up to my implementation now, I send a, a JSON string to, to a query script running on my server, OK? I send along those FB params so that the Facebook session data, and also some indication that what I want to get back is, is a list of viewer friends. So then, of course, I've got enough information to go make a Facebook call, bring it back, and send it all the way back to, to my open social object. And then it's sort of back in the, in the real world there and, and needs to, to talk back to the third party gadget. And so it has to translate that information into these person objects, which are a standard open social objects. Okay. So when, uh, when I first came up with this mechanism, uh, you know, I thought it was a little bit sort of hacky, but. Uh, I mean, looking at, at the way the, um, the example Google container works and also the, the high five stuff, that, they, they do a similar trick just to put their information into the, into the gadget. Um, another thing they do is, is, is to use the, the JSON call, which uh, I found a little bit odd because uh, the, the, uh, the open social APIs also has a definition for web services to interact with your um, your social network. And, and that, I haven't read it in too much detail, so that's why I'm uh, eyeing Patrick nervously. But uh, that, that uses G-data. Okay, so, so one thing that I think is important is that going forward, it should work internally the same way as it works externally. I mean, I, I know why you, you've done that, because it's, it's a lot easier, same reason why, why I did it. Okay, so just to talk briefly about um, what, what I think the open source movement needs to do around open social. So as I was saying there, I, I think um, you know, if we can, we can set up a, a, a framework that works, well, first of all, consistently internally, okay, so it, you know, it needs to talk to itself in the same way as it talks to uh, other web services. Okay. And you know, if, if uh, in an open source project we can come up with a JavaScript layer to wrap the G data, okay, then that, that, of course, should, should be able to talk to uh, the, the server side of our container, whether that's written in PHP or Java. Okay, so that's what I mean by being consistent across languages. So an another thing that uh, open source will do going forward is to resolve some of the ambiguities that um, have been brought up today. Uh, you know, so for one example I've, I've come up with from, from the work I've done here is the get person app data. Okay, so this is a, a call to uh, the container uh, asking to retrieve a, a particular data item for a key and user. And, okay, the, the documentation doesn't say at this stage what to do if, uh, if that doesn't already exist. Should we uh, throw an error or should we create a blank entry? And, I mean, okay, the, the problem is if, if uh, we don't resolve these ambiguities, then, of course, um, gadgets uh, written in, you know, in, in the future will have to determine where they're running and, and react differently to, to uh, different responses from the, the, the container, okay? And, you know, that, that would go the, the same way as, as JavaScript, where you need to check whether you're running on Internet Explorer or, or Firefox or whatever else. So what I've written down here is, you know, rather than weigh down the documentation with specifics, we should provide guidance through standardized open source frameworks. Okay, and the other thing, of course, is to avoid reinventing. And one thing that uh, suddenly the, the, the Google samples so far are missing is a way to, to interpret these gadgets that we fetched okay, in XML. And that's something that every container will have to do. So, uh, I mean, certainly that, that's something that um, we'll build as an open source project. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, certainly if anyone here as a gadget writer is expecting to have wide deployment uh, across you know, the, the long tail of container sites. And you know, I really think any time spent on this, this open source work you know, will, will save you personally that amount of time in the future trying to get your gadgets to, to work. 
Okay, and even better, you save the same amount of time for everyone else. So uh, I guess the secret there is to uh, uh, just leave it to someone else, and then you, uh, you get the saving for free. But, <laughs> but, uh, okay, so just to announce the, uh, the project that the Apache Foundation have, have accepted, I believe. Have they accepted this, you say? Not formally. Okay, it's, it's, uh, it, it's about to be announced. Uh, so uh, Brian McAllister here from, from Ning, he um, has put forward this shindig proposal, okay, and uh, well actually that, that was supposed to be really funny, I, fa I found out reading, the, uh, reading the, the, the mailing list, so Brian puts this forward and everyone else says, yep, yeah, great project of course, and uh, good name as well, and uh, I, I was a bit too young to understand it, so I did a quick search on the internet, and uh, to do with the shadows or, or something like that. Something rather like that, it's a good name. No, fair enough. Yeah. So, um, just quickly, the goal of Shindig... Oh, I have a microphone. I don't have to shout. Uh, the goal of Shindig is to have a standard implementation that you can download and be running a container in under 15 minutes um, that you can embed in your blog, you can embed in any application, you can go to town. Um, that is the product goal. The larger size goal, personally, is that we have an actual implementation to try and prevent the fragmentation and incompatible implementations. If you have one that's easy to download, easy to develop against, and that a lot of things are based on, it tends to help things cohere via a carrot rather than a stick. Other than that, uh, hopefully it's going to be off the ground really fast, and I invite anyone who's interested in this to help contribute. Thank you. Uh, any questions for either Dan or Brian, briefly? Yes. Uh, oh, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, actually, I did have the, the opportunity to... Could you repeat that just so that... Okay, the, sorry, the, the question up. is what do Facebook make of, of uh, OpenSocket here? Um, and uh, the answer is that I did have the chance to introduce myself to uh, Dave Moore in of, the, of the, the Facebook platform on, uh, on Friday. So uh, I went up to him slightly sheepishly and, and said, uh, oh, uh, I don't know if this is on your radar, but uh, I might have accidentally released this thing. I don't know what you think. He says, uh, oh, yeah, that, that's on my radar, and, and, and called over Charlie and uh, Sasha and says, this is the open socket guy. And uh, so I thought, well, what are they going to do? But, uh, and... and <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, when I, when I released the thing, I thought the worst thing that can happen is they delete my Facebook account, which is, which is quite bad. But, um, but no, I, Dave, Dave uh, I think, uh, detects I was a little bit nervous about his reaction. And, and he says, hey, you know, you know, don't worry about it. We, we think it's cool. OK. So I thought, well, it's a bit boring. You're supposed to, supposed to want to kill me. <laughs> OK, I see, um, as a consumer, I'm talking, right? He says, OK. I don't want Facebook to own my data or Google Orkut or Ning to own my data, but I want to do some nifty applications. Maybe I want Microsoft to own my data, you know, for that particular application, right? Or, or I trust IBM or AT&T or Apple, whatever. So, uh, you know, in fact, like Apple and Hewlett Packard are typical, you know, uh, for large corporations, trusted partners, right? They coordinate everything for their hardware needs and they make sure the company runs. So as a consumer, I can't understand all this stuff, right? So suppose I want to do my building relationships kind of app, and I, you know. So I think basically it's like you're going in, the previous demonstrator was asking the trust across networks. And that seems pretty thorny. So I think, like I said, my trusted provider is this guy, this X service provider, ISP, or a trust provider, okay? So I started going to 10 networks, but I think you said that, face, someone said that Facebook caches that, ID, I, that's their monk. Is, is that correct? Well, the the rules on, on the Facebook platform. Yeah, you like I, suppose my Orca thing is my email, my password could be my trust thing. I go through some secure method and say I identify myself. But you say Facebook violates that, right? They. Uh, oh, okay. I think. Well, okay. I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm asking. I'm saying uh, intuitively. I'm feeling that uh, uh, you know the solution is for the consumer to own his trust provider. Right, so sure. the gadget provider cannot deal with that, right? Um, well, okay. Well, well to, to, to draw that back to, to OpenSocket, as I was, I was demonstrating, um, yeah. I mean, one, one problem is, I guess, the, the different rules on on these different networks, and in in 
Facebook, sure, I, I've got to sign, as a, as a developer of OpenSocket, I've got to agree to the, the platform terms of service in terms of what I'm going to do with that data, which is why it, it, it's a difficulty uh, allowing any random third party gadget into OpenSocket. Okay. So that's a sort of a legal difficulty, I guess. And, and okay, I mean, I'm not the person to ask, basically. But uh, sure, I think a lot of these different networks have uh, uh, you know, different rules, basically. So there's something else that needs to be ironed out. Yeah, go on. Yeah, someone who knows, that's better. Um, so let me, let me rephrase this and see if I, I've got this straight. You want to say, I'd like to use the um, friend network that I've got stored at Apple or Hewlett Packard or some other provider of stuff um, in, in other containers? Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't necessarily understand my own question. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle. But let's say, like, when signed the first provider, right? Right. Right. So, so you know, Facebook is not going to trust Orca, right? That's it immediately, today. But they can't. I mean, they have yeah. a duty right, uh, to their users. Exactly. If I am one of the consumers, I'd say, I do trust uh, very sign, let's say. Oh, yeah. And so the gadget says, OK, this user at Facebook, you know, that's enough to enter into that trust provider. And I get access to 50 of my user IDs or passwords. And then, you know, the, right. you know, I can tell the gadget what I want. And I trust the gadget, and I trust very sad, but I obviously trust uh, in general every other three cats. You know, so what I'm saying is it's, yeah. it's a difficult problem. It requires a third party to mediate. Well, um, it is a difficult problem, so um, that's kind of why we haven't solved it in the first iteration of this. You basically uh, have to trust the container you're working inside and its um, relationship. Part of the point of having server-to-server -server APIs is that you could potentially create a container that uses someone else's um, friend graph, you know, trust graph within your site. So say you had your own site, um, you wanted to ha host stuff on your site, but um, say six apart or somebody wanted to, to let you bring your, your friends from there um, you, and use them in your site, you would be able to do that. Um, so that, that's the point of having a server-to-server -server API, but resolving the authentication issues around that and delegating the trust to that is, is more complex, and that's something we're still working on. But it, it's something we've, we're thinking about and something we want to make work because it's clearly useful, but the actual issues of the, the problem is you don't, as you say, you don't want to trust any arbitrary application without you know, knowing what you're giving them. Um, and there's also the issue of um, you can't just leak your own data with this stuff. You can leak your friend's data. So we need to be careful you don't accidentally give away all your friend's email address to somebody you don't trust. That, that's, that's another piece of this that, that takes some work. So um, rather than try and solve all that in one go, we, we, we're working with the existing sites, trust models for now and for their terms of service. And bridging between them is something we'd like to do in future and, and something we're working on, you know, finding ways to do that. But as you say, those are more complex. And if, you know, if you've been following the identity um, software field for the last 10 years, you can see exactly why bridging those is hard. And there are ways that people have already tried to do that. And we look to ways to incorporate that.